Friends, we are here at Iran Alive Ministries studio with another great friend and ministry partner here, um, Zach Corral. Zach, welcome to our studio. We are so privileged to have you with us. Zach has a phenomenal story and he was sharing his story with me a little before um, this program and I want you guys to also be blessed by it. Um, Zach um, goes by um, the, the verse from Matthew 5.43 that really Jesus talks about, um, it is said to love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but today I'm asking you to love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. This has been um, the motto um, uh, through which Zach is living his life. And we're so proud of you, um, Zach, for uh, the journey that you have taken with the Lord um, from your childhood and um, into really becoming a missionary where your enemies are and you're going to those regions yeah. and, um, and you're ministering to them and you're serving them as you have been called by the Lord. Yeah. So I really love for the audience to briefly get to know yeah. you. Yeah. And then if you don't mind, uh, just share your journey about, from your childhood, how you came to faith, yeah. your walk with the Lord and why you feel that the Lord called you to go to those regions that may be or may, may seem as your enemies totally. and you're serving them as yes. your enemies. Yes. So go ahead. First of all, I just want to say thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Yes. Like you guys are incredible just to host me the way you guys have. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm the oldest of four boys. Okay. So I don't know if you have any siblings. I do have two sisters. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So God bless your mama. But imagine having four boys in this two bedroom apartment. You know, so we were literally on top of each other. Right. And so we, it was a zoo 24 seven, you know, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Like we really love each other, you know, we did everything together. And so sure, I'm the oldest, the youngest is named Christian, mm -hmm. the next Jordan and the one who was closest to me, his name was Joshua. Right. And we're 16 months apart. And so we shared the same everything. We right. shared the same bed, shared the same car, the same phone, literally everything besides maybe a toothbrush, you know, and mm -hmm. even at times we shared that. He I'm sure. He didn't know that, though, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, but he was my best friend. And, um, you know, there's a proverb that says, you know, a man who has many friends often leads to ruins, but there's always a friend that's closer right. than a brother. And so he was a brother, but he was also my friend like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I remember um, the day like it was yesterday, he was nine, I was 11 years old. And we turn on the TV, we're about to go to school, to walk to school together. And we see these planes hit these towers. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we're just young boys. We don't really understand what's going on. Right. At least I didn't, you know, but for him, that made an impact on him. And a couple of days later, you know, he reached out to my grandparents and said, hey, like, I want to do something about this. You know, so at a very young age, he was marked. Mm -hmm. He was military minded. Mm -hmm. He wanted to seek justice at all times. That's who he was. That's always how I knew him to be. You know, if there was something that needed justice, right? right? He would stand or, up. Yeah, he would stand up if it was for the better or worse, right? Wow. And so he's 18 years old and he decides to, to be a Marine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fought him tooth and nail for it because I loved him and I knew what that would do. Right. To my mother, especially, you know, because any time that you send a son off to war, right. you know, you really don't know what's going to happen to him. Absolutely. And what so, year was this? Yeah, so this was 2011. Right. Yeah, and so this is 10 years after 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and so when I found out he wanted to be a Marine, he went to Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And so I actually moved to San Diego to go to school so we could be near each oh. other. I just want to be next to, you know, my little brother. And I remember the last day that I saw him, mm. you know, he actually um, had the American flag wrapped around his body. Wow. And he hugged me and wrapped it around mm -hmm. me. And he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too. Oh. And um, a couple months later, you know, 
he came home the same way I left him, and that was with the American flag wrapped around his mm. body, except mm. he was locked in a box this time. I completely understand the pain yeah. um, that you must have yeah. felt uh, after really after his passing and losing him. Yeah. Um, but I want, I know it something really um, drastic happened to you after losing him, after yeah. losing your best friend that you grew up with and shared everything together. Um, tell us about what happened after that. Yeah. A short day or a short couple of days after, you know, getting the call from my father, he actually had called me a couple of times and I was in the car with one of my brother's best friends who just got back from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad called me twice and I ignored both of those calls and he called me a third time. I thought that was so weird. And so I picked up and he said one word. He said, Zachary. And mm. I knew it. Mm. And immediately I said, is he alive? And my father said no. And this started seven years, six years really of rebellion, you know. Right. Even a couple of days after that, they asked me if I wanted to see his body. Yeah. You know, and for me, I was like, I don't want to even go there. I'm already in enough pain, you know. But I saw sure. my father go and see him, and then I just tiptoed toward that coffin. And as soon as I saw mm. his feet, I sprinted right to it. And I fell at his feet. And I was weeping, but all of a sudden, there were no tears left in my eyes. Why? And I went from deep and deep, deep pain to anger because those feet that used to follow me around mm. all the time, mm. they were plastic. Yeah. And so then I moved to his legs and they were plastic. And his torso was plastic. Yeah. And his arms were plastic and I just put my head on his chest that was also plastic and I looked up his head and I realized that all they did was stitch his head onto a plastic body. So he was more plastic than a person. He was more of a mannequin than a man. Right. And that's when I just stood on my feet and I cursed God and I said, if, mm. if you're really real, you clearly don't love me and I want nothing to do with you. And, and that started mm -hmm. six years of rebellion, to right. say the very least. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I wonder how many people right now are watching this yeah. and they have had some sort of tragedy in their yes. life that yeah. they thought that God is bringing all of these bad things into yeah. their lives and God is the cause of it. God is allowing tragedy yeah. to enter, trauma to enter their life and are blaming God for yeah. all of the heartache that they're experiencing, yeah. all the pain and the hurts and the persecution that they're experiencing. So tell us about what happened after that. Six yeah. years of rebellion, you yeah. felt, were you walking pretty close with the Lord? Were you, was your relationship pretty intimate at that point? Yeah. Um, and you sort of fell back or it was sort of a casual yeah. relationship with the Lord and this yeah. just did it. You're like, God, why would you allow something like this happen yeah. to me? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say I was definitely a, a casual Christian, a right. lukewarm Christian, right. where I was living way more in the world than in the word, you know? And sure. so sure. I was already in rebellion. Sure. But when I stood over my, you know, my brother's cold, dead right. body, right. it just brought me to a new place sure. where everything that I was in rebellion with prior right. just emphasized Absolutely. 10 a hundredfold sure. you know and so I was telling you earlier how I would go to sleep and in such pain right. um, but in such rebellion where a demonic door would open up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and would literally suffocate me so I couldn't breathe and the mm -hmm. only thing that they would ever let me do was curse God right and so I was over that right, right? I didn't want to go to sleep anymore right and so I would drink I would smoke, do whatever I could to potentially numb this pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, I was being tormented day and night. And even more so, too, I had a repetitive dream right. where I was actually with my brother when he was walking his line. Right. And when he stepped on that bomb and I'm in the dream and I'm standing right beside him. Right. And I know that there's a bomb right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to convince him. I'm grabbing him. I'm like, please, mm -hmm. like, do not go there. There's a bomb. You're going to die. Yeah. And he would ignore me. Yeah. And I grab him again, like, please, please. Like, there's a bomb right there, Joshua. You're going to die. Yeah. 
And after a couple minutes within the dream of not being able to convince him, I knew he was going to step on it. And I said, I love you. And he turned and he said, I love you too. Mm. And the bang, the bomb goes off. I look at my hand and I have his blood on my hands. Mm. And I wake up and for six years, six words tormented me. Yeah. His blood is on your hands. Oh, wow. And so I, I, I mm. live with this guilt right. and this pain, this torment. I mean, I just told you about the torment, but also the heartbreak, you know, yeah. like I remember literally contemplating, like, I wonder, like, what's in more pieces? Is it his body or my heart? Because yeah. I'm completely shattered. I am broken. Yeah. And I reached the end of myself like we all do when we yeah. find Jesus. And I said, God, if you love me, save me. And I had this radical encounter where I felt the presence of God, the love of God overflow in me, like all through my vessel, something I had never felt before. You know, like I said, I was a casual Christian, mm -hmm. you know, but I never encountered the God that I said that I knew. Yeah. And in a moment, I knew he was real and I knew that Jesus loved me. And I think one of the biggest miracles outside of him saving me was that he actually gave me a heart for who the world called my enemies. Right. And shortly actually sent me to whom the world called my enemies to preach the simple gospel and the love of wow. God. Wow. So you, okay, so after your brother's passing, yeah. uh, you blamed God for, yes. for this tragedy, uh, tragedy. And then you also would have nightmares yes. to where uh, you felt shame and you guilt, felt guilt pain. as if it was your problem, as if you My caused fault. this. It was right? your fault. Yeah. And so the power of darkness, principalities, demonic forces yeah. were just attacking you what they do best. with this. And mm -hmm. to, to really overcome this feeling, yeah. to really yeah. tune out from the world you lived in, yeah. you basically went to drugs, alcohol to numb yourself. Yeah, name it. And, and all kinds of things to yeah. really numb yourself. And then that yeah. pivotal moment where... Yeah when you got on your knees or you asked the Lord, talk to us about that. When did that yeah. happen? Yeah. When, or was it in a situation where you were like, you know what, I'm at the end of the rope. Yeah. I'm done with myself. I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I was, in, I was in my room and it was just me. Yeah. You know, and I had poured out some wine with a little uh, cough syrup mm -hmm. because it would put me to bed. Sure really quick right you know but even in the midst of the pain i was doing it you know because i didn't want to feel that pain but still my pillow was wet wow from my tears right you know so there was no hiding my pain right there was nothing you know so in the midst of that i realized when i came to the end of myself i really came to the end of my life where i said i don't want to live like this right any longer right right and you so were disgusted just, with the feeling you're I like, was disgusted with, with myself. Yeah. Right. Again, like you said, I put all the all the guilt on me. Yeah. Like I'm the older brother. I should have been there. Right. For him. Right. Right. right like right. I should have been the one uh, who who was in his place. You know. And even in the midst of that, you mm -hmm. know, I had a conversation. Yeah. Uh, with the person who actually tried saving him that night, when he um, stepped on that bomb, mm -hmm. and what brought me even more anger was him saying that actually it wasn't your brother who was supposed to have the metal detector that night. It was me who was supposed to have it. Mm. Your brother took my place. It should have been me. <sighs> yeah. And so all that confusion, like right. God, he wasn't even supposed to be in that place. Right. He wasn't even supposed to be the one who was dead. Why didn't you and save him? He is. Why didn't you save him? Mm -hmm. And you say you love me? Yeah. But here I'm in pain and I'm ready to put a bullet in my brain. Yes. And so you're, you're right, it was torment. And the only thing that I really had, right, the only thing that I had to hold on to was this. And it was a letter that he sent me. Oh, wow. And so this is what I would hold on to when I was ready to say goodbye. Mm. And I oftentimes would only be able to get through the first sentence because right. it was so painful. Right. And I'll read it for you guys today, but it says, Dear Zach, I first want to say that I love you 
and I miss you so much. It's sometimes depressing being away for so long, but I'm fighting through it day by day. Overall, I'm doing good, so you don't have to worry about me. Hmm. And he goes on to finish the letter, and he says something that, you know, I always wanted to hear from him. He said, I love you. I love you all, hmm. but I love you. You're an older brother, one who always tried to make things right when I didn't want to, one who never gave up on me, one who always believed in me, and most importantly, one who never ceased to love me. I look up to you, Zach. Whether it seemed like it or not, I always will. I love you. I hope this gets to you soon. So mm. this is what I held on to right. for the longest of time until this couldn't even do it for me either. Right. And I needed something more than a letter. I needed a real manifest love that I had never felt before. Mm. And that's what I felt from the Lord in that moment. Lord, if you love me, save me. And that changed everything. It changed everything. Wow. So talk to us about the redeeming power yeah. of Christ. He yeah. basically, from what you just shared with us, he turned your ashes for beauty, yeah. your yeah. pain for joy. Talk yeah. to us about his redeeming power to be able to turn you into the yeah. person that you are today, full of joy, yeah. full of mercy, full yeah. of grace, going yeah. to all the, you know, to the ends of the earth, yes. making disciples in the name yeah. of Jesus and really abiding by his great commission. Yeah. Talk to us how he redeemed you from all that pain. Yeah. So I, w I would say it like this, you know, I think the difference between someone being a casual Christian mm -hmm. and someone who's actually a disciple of Christ and all in is that they just haven't tasted and seen. Right. Right. You haven't tasted and seen the goodness of God, that love encounter that you had. And so when I had that, you know, yeah. and simultaneously while I walked with him, he began to give me a heart for those who the Lord, you know, the world called my enemies. Right. And so in the midst of that, talk about redemption, how everything comes full circle. Right. Right. So in Hawaii, a volcano went off and they asked me to take a team over to the other side of the islands uh, just to do some mercy ministry and help them all out. And mm -hmm. I was on a prayer walk on the other side of the island, just uh, about 100 miles away from Kona where, you know, I reside. And, and uh, I walk in, you know, I'm walking and I run into this man and he approaches me and he's like, hey, I'm a pastor at this church. It's a cafe right now, but mm -hmm. on the weekends, you know, it's a church and I love to connect. And, and so we talked for a little bit and he asked me my story. I said, you know, I really feel like from the Lord that he wants uh, to send me to Afghanistan, but I understand I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't go to places like that as a missionary, right. nor do you just get invited to places like that, you right. know? And so he looked at me, he said, this is crazy. I want you to meet a man tomorrow. Meet me here at the same time. I'll introduce you to him. So the next day I meet this man. He says, so you're a missionary and you want to go to Afghanistan? And I said, I do. He said, you don't go to Afghanistan as a missionary. I said, I know. Mm. He's like, First of all, you need an NGO, which is a non-government organization, to get into a place like that. Yes. And I said, I understand. And he said, unfortunately, in 2014, all the NGOs pretty much left because the Taliban mm -hmm. was targeting them because, you know, they were expats sure. and a lot of Americans. And he said, actually, I'm part of one, mm. a global NGO that's all over the world. But my role in that NGO just so happens to be field director of Afghanistan. Wow. And by the way, when your brother died, I was a colonel in Afghanistan. Mm. And he said, I'm leaving in three weeks. Give me your passport. We're going together. Wow. And so here's another God story for you, right? There's three weeks. Absolutely. And so there's no time. And if anyone's, you know, privy to how things are done in Afghanistan, it's a little bit slower, <laughs> right? Right. They take their time. Right. I, could, I could appreciate that, but when you're on my side of things, sure. I need something to get done. And so my um, visa actually got um, canceled twice, you know, oh, no. uh, but on the third time, uh, I got accepted in there and it so happened to be on the morning of September 11th. Oh, wow. 
when this all really began. Wow. And so he brought me to the place where, where my brother's blood and bones were. Wow. And from there, he took me to the place, uh, the birthplace of ISIS and the Taliban, Pakistan, um, you know, who really had my brother's blood on their hands. Right. And it was just an incredible thing. It was surreal because I have a mic and in mm -hmm. front of me over 75,000 Muslims and we give them the simple gospel. Wow. And many come to Jesus and the power of God hits many. We see signs, wonders, and miracles. Wow. And so if you talk about how God really has redemption at the forefront of his heart and that he writes our story, he yes. writes stories that we could never imagine to even write ourselves. Absolutely. So he has certainly redeemed me in that way and continues to do so. Absolutely. God certainly loves our enemies. Yes, he does. Yeah. And he asks us to love our enemies. Yes. So um, I know yes. you have so many different uh, parts of the story that you yeah. want to cover. You mentioned yeah. about the story of Jonah. Yes. And um, Jonah, as we all know, uh, rebelled <laughs> against the Lord and the call on his life yes. uh, multiple times. Um, yeah. How do you correlate Jonah's life yeah. with your life and also maybe some of us believers? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of us are pretty familiar about the story of Jonah. Mm -hmm. You know, he calls his prophet Jonah. And yes. He says, Jonah, I want you to go here. Yes. And Jonah goes there and right. as far possible as there is. Right. 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 And, uh, when we read the story, we're, we're not really certain as to why he would rebel and why he would run so far away from the call of God in his life. And right. it might even be the same reason why some of you are running from the call of God in your life. And I'll explain it to you right now. You guys know the story. He has a change of heart. He gets swallowed up in the belly of a beast. He gets spit out into Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He gives a simple message of repentance. And all of them, including the king, repent. Right. And Jonah's still mad. Right. He's still angry about it. And this is why. Is because Jonah and Israel had really, really, really bad family history mm -hmm. with the Assyrians. And so if you're little Jonah, these are the stories mm. that you're hearing as a kid. So if you're at home, you can close your eyes and I want you just to imagine being Jonah. Because this is what's being told to you. It's this. It's Jonah, my son. Those people over there, the Ninevites, the Assyrians, they're devils. Mm -hmm. They're wicked people. God hates them. He will pour out his wrath on them. He will judge them. He will vindicate him. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. will vindicate us. Right. Those people, those Assyrians, they used to decorate our city gates mm -hmm. and our trees with the severed heads of our loved ones. They would make us dig up the dead and mm. grind mm. their bones to dust. And by the way, your great grandmother stood up to them mm. and she was filleted to death, but not before mm. her children were burned alive in front of her. Oh yeah. And by the way, your grandfather, your great grandfather, this is what they did to him. They took a tree and they sharpened the top of it and they plunged it through his belly and they lifted it up Wow! and there he stood high and lifted up for all to see. Mm -hmm. And so what does God do? He says, Jonah, those people, I love those people. Wow. I love those people. And the book of Jonah ends with this, right? They just didn't know. Mm -hmm. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Jonah, they have no idea. Right. And even in that, Right. I think that reminds us of another story mm -hmm. where God sends his son in the midst of the ultimate beast, Rome. Right. And he's sitting there high and lifted up on a tree. And he says to his father, Father, forgive wow. them for they know not mm. what they do. And even in the midst of that, I think of like this real raw moment, right? right? That... Jesus must have had with even that Roman soldier, you mm -hmm. know, who's about mm -hmm. to put a nail through his wrist. Right. And I could just see Jesus looking over at that hand as it fastens a nail on his wrist and just thinking to himself, like, I remember. Right. 
when I knit you and formed you, those hands in your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And looking at the eyes of the Roman soldier and being like, I remember when I saw my reflection in those. Right. That's the love of God. Scripture says this, that some will die for a good man. But God demonstrates his great love for us that even while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And so if there's anything that I do know is that Jesus loves our enemies, but he also loves his enemies too. That's right. That's right. I mean, Zach, it was beautiful. Like so many different stories you unpacked yeah. for us here, yeah. which so many of us believers probably didn't even know. Oh my gosh, yeah. what was Jonah up against? <laughs> right. Like we're like all we hear about the Bible story yeah. is that Jonah is this rebellious man. He's yeah. going against the call of God, yeah. but you just totally unpacked the dynamics yeah. and the context that he was dealing with. He yeah. knew that. You know, it wasn't going to be a pleasant place where God yeah. was calling him to go. Yeah. And um, he had a little history, um, you know, in that, in that country or Certainly. region that, that God called him to go, just yeah. like you. The yeah. correlation is just like you. You lost your brother, your best friend in Afghanistan yeah. where God called you to go to that very place. Yeah. And you probably were doubting yourself and like did you ever ask God God why there of all the places yeah why not China why yeah. not Africa why yeah. not anywhere else that um, I'm not um, constantly reminded of the pain that I suffered yeah. did you ever ask God that yeah I certainly did and I think it's only in his wisdom yes that he knew that even sending me there would bring an incredible sense of healing to my heart. Yes. You know, Isaiah 61 says that he has come to preach the good news, but also set free the captive and bind up the brokenhearted. You know, and I was in the midst of having a broken heart, and he knew right. that there were pieces of me that were in places that I had not been yet. Right. And where my brother's blood and bones were, you know, I felt like a piece of me had died. Right. You know, absolutely. So in his wisdom and actually great love for me, you know, he sent me to that place. Right. Healed my heart in that, mm. you know. And of course, it's all for his glory. You know, the fact that he would send me to a place like that. Right. Where people don't even understand, like, that's where you want to go. Right. Right. Like the, pl the, the place where your brother died. Right. That's where you're going. Right. And I realized it wasn't even my job to really explain that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I knew that God had a plan. And in the midst of not really trying to understand the why, right. you know, but just walking my line and being obedient is when the why actually begins to be revealed to us and God's master plan and his fingerprint, you know, on our life. Isn't that amazing, Zach? When we walk yes. an intimate walk with God and yeah. we have this relationship with him, he yeah. may ask us and he will ask us to do things that are just totally against <laughs> our will yes. for our life, our plans for our life. Yes. You mentioned something. You said, I had to die in myself yeah. so yeah. he can raise up in me. Yeah. So at times we do need to die to our flesh, to ourselves, Every to day. our desires, to our wills, so that He can raise up Himself yeah. in us, yeah. so He can rise up in us. So what, I'm, what I really, really um, want us to do here, yeah. Zach, as you know, um, the country of Iran, where we're, yeah. most of our ministry is to, is really surrounded by darkness, principalities, yeah. demonic forces, yeah. powers of darkness. Yeah. And the government in Iran is really having the people tight. He has, mm. the, the government has a tight grip on people yeah. and they really feel trapped. They um, don't have the freedom. They're isolated. They're yeah. fearful of, you know, what's going on in, in Iran. And um, there's no religious freedom. 
Um, yeah. They, you know, if if they choose to leave their faith and decide to become a Christian, there's severe persecution there. Mm. There is a lot of pain and hurts mm. in Iran. As a result, mm. um, the drug use per capita in Iran is very high. Yeah. The suicide rate wow. is skyrocketing. So there is a lot of tragedy that's going on yeah. because of parents losing their teenagers. Yeah. Teenagers are losing their mothers because the suicide rate among Iranian women is the highest in the world. Wow. And because wow. they feel helpless. Yeah. There's so much injustice. There's yeah. so much darkness in Iran mm. um, that people just, like you said, you got to the end of the rope. You were like, I'm done with I'm disgusted with myself. Yeah. I'm disgusted with the shame, with the guilt, with this darkness that I'm in, with the nightmares that I'm having. I'm done. I'm yeah. ready to pull the trigger. I'm ready to be done with my life. Hmm. I want you to look at the camera and really feel as though the audience that is watching you are the ones that were in your place now. Yeah. As if, as, as if they were you. Yeah. Remember that moment that you were like, I'm done. Lord, yeah. I am on my knees. If yeah. you can save, save me now. Yeah. What message do you have for those that have yeah. um, really have turned into drugs, have yeah. turned into um, cough medicine to numb themselves, have, have turned into alcohol, have turned into so many different dark yeah. things in life and they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel yeah what would you tell them yeah i would say this that he is the light at the end of the tunnel that if there's anything that i know god to be is that he is faithful he is faithful and like i had mentioned before that while we are still sinners christ died for us that god was willing to give up his everything that he might have you. His suffering, every trial he went through, the rejection, the betrayal of his best friends, coming to his own and, and his own rejecting him. If there's anyone who can actually relate to your pain, it's God himself. God can relate to you in your pain. God can deliver you. And on the same way how the Lord had brought me on this road to healing, the same person who started it will be the same one who will finish it. And that's a person, and his name is Jesus. And if he's faithful to do it for me, I promise you he is faithful to do it for you. He is in love with you. He is in love with you. And I would say this, if you're at that point of desperation, just do what I did because God is faithful to respond to the broken heart and just say, mm. God, if you love me, save me. Amen. And I, I definitely want to reiterate the exact same thing Zach just said. If you are living in darkness, if you are at the point of hopelessness and you have lost all hopes yeah. and you feel that there is nothing else to try for me to re regain my joy, for me to regain my hope in life, there is nothing else that can help me there is one force, yeah. one power that can help you, and that is Jesus Christ. He yeah. came to this earth, lived a perfect life, shed his blood on the cross so that you and I and Zach, all of us, can be redeemed from the power of darkness, from guilt, from shame, from sin, so that we can have, a, have life and have it more abundantly. And yes. that same life is offered to you today. Yeah. So if you want to have a life, if you want to have an everlasting life, if you want to become a new creation in Christ, yes. today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. Open up your heart and say, Lord, I need you. There is nothing in this life
that I can depend on. But I know that you have come to the earth and died for me because you loved me so much. And I'm ready for that intimate relationship, personal relationship that I can have with you through Christ. Lord, I ask you, I invite you to come and enter my heart, enter my life and change me so I can become your partner on earth with you. If that is you and you want this, this invitation is for you. Jesus yes. is able to give you hope, to give you future, and he does not want bad things. Tragedies happen in life. We all live in a fallen world, but he is able, just like Zach said, to turn our ashes for beauty. He is able to turn your pain and sorrow to joy. So if you're ready today, this invitation is for you. I pray that you pray this with us and invite the Lord into your heart and be filled with hope everlasting that only Christ can fill your hearts with. Yes. So Zach, is there anything else in yeah. closing that you want to share with our audience today? Yeah. yeah, I would just share this, you know, for people who still don't believe that God really loves them. You know, I'll just share a personal encounter that I had. Yes with the Lord where he brought me to a vision in this very specific day in history. Mm -hmm. And it was the day of Passover. Mm -hmm. And it was a custom of Rome to release a Jewish prisoner to the people. And so you have Pontius Pilate and you have two prisoners. One of them, his name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's just been interrogated five times. He's beaten and he's bruised and he's in the midst of his sixth interrogation. He's bound and he's shackled, but he's also not the only man that's bound and shackled. There's another man right before him, and his name is Barabbas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Barabbas was a thief. He was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. Right. And the scene is set. You have two prisoners, one judge, and one death sentence to give. Someone's going to die, and someone's going to live. Right. Who is it going to be? And Pontius Pilate says this, which of these two do you want to be free? Mm -hmm. So if there was ever a moment, if there's ever a moment in the world history where we could actually put our faith in man to seek justice, mm -hmm. to make the right decision, it's that moment. Right. It's that moment we, we could actually say, you know what? I think the heart of man can make the right decision here. Who do you want free? Mm -hmm. And the crowd says, we want Barabbas. Yeah. And if there was ever a moment where God could really reveal the depravity of the heart of man, it's right there. Mm -hmm. And to make matters worse, he asks the second question, then what shall I do with this man, Jesus? Mm -hmm. And the crowd says, crucify him. Mm -hmm. Crucify him. And in that moment, Barabbas turned around in the vision. And Barabbas didn't look to be how I thought he would look. In fact, Barabbas looked just like me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, the Lord took me to a memory when the man who tried to save my brother said, Zach, hmm. your brother took my place. It should have been me. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Zach, I took your place. Wow. It should have been you. Wow. And right then and there, I realized, Lord, you love me. Mm. You laid it all down for me. Mm. And the Bible is really specific, too. You know that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, that right. I'm not the only Barabbas yes. that walks around on this earth. Right. You know, right. so the Bible says this, if you're on the fence, if you're not really sure, if your heart is still hard, and I just want you to know that there is a moment, the Bible says that every man will find him in the presence of Jesus, except he will not stand as one of the condemned mm -hmm. anymore, but he will stand as judge. Yes. And there will be no one to the left of you, and there will be no one to the right of you. 
It will be you, one judge, and one death sentence to give. Right. And if there was ever a moment where you could actually put your full faith in Jesus, if you haven't on this side of things, it's that moment for him to seek justice, to make the right opportunity, and mm -hmm. his verdict would be your verdict over your life, and that's guilty. Right. You're guilty. You're guilty of Barabbas' punishment. Mm -hmm. The penalty for sin is death. Mm -hmm. But this is the good news. The good news that you just preached is that God, Christ himself, stood in the midst of the condemned. The only one who was actually justified before God, he stood as the condemned so the condemned could be justified. Right. So we could be right standing with God. This is the good news. There are two people right. who are going to stand on Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. There is one who comes with his own righteousness, and a thousand of his greatest deeds will be consumed by the wrath of God because the Scripture says that our righteousness is as a filthy rags. Yes. But then there's going to be people like you and I who have realized that we can't do this on our own, no. right, who will come with another man's righteousness, Christ Jesus' righteousness, and a thousand of our most wicked deeds will be consumed by the mercy and the love of God. Amen. And he'll That's say, good. now come, let yes. me love you. That's good. This is the good news. It's way better than you've been taught. It's way better than maybe someone has told you. Mm -hmm. But this is what the cross was all about, to restore intimacy, that you can know God and know him now. This is not a punch your ticket to heaven gospel this is a you can have eternal life life with the eternal one right now and you can know him and his love for you that's so good zach everything changes everything. when you realize the lord just loved you so much that yes. he took your place yes that everything changes you're like oh my gosh this is a revelation yeah. knowledge that i needed to have because yeah. we uh, innately we all want to know that we're loved amen and what better love than <laughs> right. the love of our Father <laughs> for us who came and took our place for us yes. so that we can stand in right standing yes. with God. That's yes. the best love. So today, yes. if you feel like you're not loved, Yes. If you feel like nobody loves me, everyone has left me, I, my, my life is filled with pain, know this, your Father loves you. Amen. Jesus came to this earth because He loved you so much that He gave His own life so that you can have an, an eternal life with Him, so that you can not only have joy and the fullness of life on this earth, but also have an eternal life with Him, spending eternity with your Father. How good is that? So yeah. today, again, if you hear the voice of the Lord through this program, open up your heart and invite Christ into your life because He comes in, the Holy Spirit comes in, changes your heart. Yeah. Just like the Holy Spirit changed Zach's yes. heart to love his enemy, to love God's enemy. How can you love your enemy? that killed your brother. How can you love God's enemy except through the power of the Holy Spirit that has been poured into you? You are able to receive that love today. Amen. The moment you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's a promise of God. And He pours such love in you that you are going to have the power and be able to love your enemy. That is amazing. This is why Amen. we're here to, to really tell the audience, to everyone who watches us, know that Christ came so that we can have a blessed life yes. here on earth, yes. walk with Him, knowing that on the other side of our obedience, yeah. somebody is waiting. Yes. Someone is waiting on the other side of our obedience. You obeyed the Lord by taking the step and die to yourself yes. so that he can share the good news with so yeah. many Muslims as you're going to Afghanistan yeah. and so many different regions in the Middle East. So thank you for your, yeah. for your step of obedience. Thank, thank you. you, Zach, for joining us today on this program. It was such an honor and a privilege to have you share Appreciate your story it. with us. 
I trust and I know that so many people that will get to watch this will really receive the message of love, restoration, and redemption that the Lord yes. Jesus has provided for them already. Yes. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.